Hello, fellow time travelers. A friend of mine found this rather yellow mystery box and saved it from being e-recycled. I don't know anything about it, other than it has a Pentium 3 processor in it, which places it around the end of the 90s or the early 2000s. A quick once-over shows us that it probably came from a smoker's house, and it's looking pretty grungy on the outside. Another concerning thing is the fan from the power supply seems to be missing. That's not going to be doing anything good for the life expectancy of the components. All over the outside, there was a thin layer of sticky dust clinging to the surfaces of the case. It's even collected around the card slots in the back of the unit. Of course, the yellowing on the outside is probably of the UV variety, and the lack of fan may mean that there's a relatively dust-free environment on the inside. There's only one way to find out, we're gonna have to open it up. Of course, we'll want to be fashionable, so it's time to don some gloves. I'll start by giving the exterior of the case a quick wipe down with some alcohol. Alright, we've put this off as long as we can, let's crack the case and see what we're dealing with. Yikes. This thing is dirtier than most browser histories. I used to work in a small repair shop and we'd often get dusty computers in for a cleaning, but this is right up there with the worst of them and I'm pretty glad I put the gloves on first. The cards, the cables, and really the whole case are filled with this thick, sticky dust. We're lucky this machine comes from a time when active cooling wasn't always needed, but all this insulation certainly wasn't helping anything. Well, there's nothing to do but get to cleaning. And unfortunately, a vacuum alone isn't going to be enough to cut it. This gunk is just too well baked on. So I'll use an anti-static brush and loosen it as I go. Now we get our first look at the processor. It looks like a Pentium 3 clocked at 450 MHz. This was one of the first processors available at the Pentium 3 launch and that puts it right around 1999. If the inside of this case is that covered in dirt, I can only imagine what's happening in the floppy and CD-ROM drive. It also seemed like everywhere I looked, there was hot glue holding components together. Now I certainly understand wanting to make sure that your wires don't come disconnected, but this makes servicing it a real pain. And yeah, as expected, the floppy drive is full of the same sticky dust. Now it's time to turn our attention to that power supply. Originally I was just going to replace it, but I decided that it would be cool to try and salvage as much as possible. So let's start by removing as much dust and buildup as possible.
And let's address the fan. As a replacement, I got this 80mm off of Amazon. To power it, I'll just pass the cable out the back of the PSU with the rest of the wires, and I should be able to plug it into one of the motherboard headers. Well, now that the components are mostly clean, we gotta do something about the yellowing on the case. So we'll turn to retrobriting and try to restore it to its original color. Now, retrobriting can be done in multiple ways, but for me, I'll be coating the front of this case in Salon Developer Cream. then wrapping it in cling wrap, and then placing it into my aluminum foil lined UV lit box. And through the magic of time travel, it's now eight hours later and we can see how we did. The change is pretty remarkable. You can see just how much it's improved compared to these untreated pieces. It looks just about new. So I'll take these finished parts upstairs to be rinsed off and then give the remaining pieces the same treatment. Well, it's not perfect, but all the parts are a lot cleaner than they were before, so now it's time to put it back together and see if it actually works. And here it is fully assembled. I have to admit, it came out really clean. I'd have to imagine this is pretty much how it looked when it was brand new. Moment of truth, time to turn it on and see what happens. And it's alive. Now I'll just adjust the refresh rate so it doesn't flicker so much and... Well, that's better but not perfect. The camera and screen are both set to 60Hz, but they're just a little out of sync. But I think it's the best I can do. With it back together, let's take a look at the specs. It's an Intel Pentium 3 processor running at 450 MHz, coupled with 192 megs of PC100 SD RAM. The motherboard is an ABIT BE6 slot 1 board running the Intel 440BX chipset. Graphics are handled by an 8 MB Silicon Integrated System 6326 on the HEP 2X interface, while audio is handled by a Crystal SoundFusion PCI sound card. Along with the optical and floppy drives, we also have a 13 GB Fujitsu IDE hard drive for storage, and the entire thing's running on Windows 98 Second Edition. Before getting to installing any of my own software, I thought it'd be cool to take a look around and see what games the previous owner might have left behind. The first I saw was Demolition Racer, but unfortunately the original CD is required, so it's a no-go. Luckily, the next set of games definitely runs with no disc required. The best of Windows Entertainment Pack is a collection of fun, time-killing games, like Ski Free. Ski down the hill in one of the three included courses, and always get eaten by the Yeti no matter how fast you go. Then there's Jazzball. 
The goal is to clear 75% of the game board without your cutting lines getting hit by the bouncing balls. Each level adds an additional ball, making it more and more difficult. And one of my personal favorites was Chips Challenge. Collect all the chips on the board to move on to the next one. Each level has progressively more difficult puzzles to solve. And honestly, this machine is obviously overkill for all the games in this collection. Poking around on the hard drive, I found a couple of Christmas-themed games. I vaguely remember them being popular in the early 2000s, and it feels a lot like Flash games. The first is Elf Shuffleboard. Slingshot your elf as far down the shuffleboard as you can without sending him over the edge. If he does go over, well, then he gets eaten by sharks. It's the kind of silly fun that'll cure your boredom for a few minutes, but I don't see it getting an HD remake anytime soon. And in the same vein, we have elf bowling. You're Santa Claus, and you're knocking over your elves with a bowling ball. And just for the fun of it, occasionally an elf gets decapitated by the re-racking equipment. I also found this picture of the former Prime Minister of Canada, John Chrétien. Next, I wanted to move on to installing my own games, only to discover that the optical drive wouldn't open. I thought maybe I'd made a mistake in the reassembly, but after taking it apart, I found that the manual jack still worked, but the motor just didn't seem to have enough strength to eject it on its own. After digging through my spare parts, I settled on this creative 52 times drive. It's slightly newer than the original one, but I'm going to say close enough. Now that the optical drive has been dealt with, let's take a trip to Springfield. Virtually, that is. Virtual Springfield is a point-and-click style game that allows you to tour the home city of The Simpsons. As you move around, you'll find familiar landmarks and frequently are treated to little clips of the characters judging you. Eventually, you'll find your way to the Simpsons house and be able to tour it. It's a pretty well done thing and runs just fine on this machine. I wanted to give Elite Force a shot, but after installing it, it became apparent that the GPU or its drivers doesn't support OpenGL, so Quake 3 engine based games are going to be off the table. Next, I thought, why not give Carmageddon a shot? But when trying to run it, it crashed under Windows. So next, I added CD-ROM support to the MS-DOS mode and tried to run it from DOS. And it freezes the machine. Looks like we're 0 for 2. But that's okay because we've got Carmageddon 2. And after launching and having the first intro video play, it crashes to desktop. After setting render to software mode, something we'll see more of in this video, I was able to get it to run. And the game runs reasonably well although it's kind of hard to figure out what's going on and what everything is supposed to be. Since Elite Force was a bust, I moved on to Starfleet Command Neutral Zone. You pick your faction and take command of various ships to complete missions in advance. And it runs just fine on this hardware, although the game does feel slower paced than I remember it being. Moving on to a game that was gaining popularity when this machine was new, I thought I'd give Unreal Tournament a try. Under DirectX mode, it's about what I expected. Single digit frame rates, screen tearing, and graphical artifacts. It makes it pretty much unplayable. Switching to software mode, however, the entire story changes. Now we have gameplay that, while not pretty, is perfectly acceptable, with that Pentium 3 processor proving it can do the heavy lifting when required. Of course, with the original system requirements only needing a 200 MHz Pentium 1, that's really not much of a surprise. I also tried Star Trek Pinball. It runs fine, but it honestly isn't exactly the greatest pinball game to play. It feels kind of boring and more just like cashing in on a franchise that Interplay already had, which is likely exactly what it is. There are three tables, the third one being able to be played by two players simultaneously. There's not much to say here. It's pinball, but Star Trek themed. I happen to have a copy of Lynx 99, and since both the processor and game are from the same year, I thought, why not? This game is pretty simple. You click and hold the mouse to swing the club, and you try to release it on the lines on the power meter. It does look pretty good though, and the animations on the player are really well done. Finally, I wanted to wrap things up with quite possibly the most popular PC game of the era, 
Half-Life, like most other games I tested, did not perform well under DirectX. A little searching on the GPU will tell you that, while it did media decoding pretty well, its gaming performance was always abysmal. Switching to software mode at a low resolution yielded between 15 and 20 frames a second, which still felt pretty playable. Everything looked pretty chunky, but I can remember having to turn graphics way down on many games around this time to play on my subpar PC. But Half-Life, regardless of the resolution, is always a pleasure to play. Well, now that this machine is all fixed up and running, what do you think I should do with it? Should I leave it as is, as some sort of time capsule to what basic computers look like at the turn of the millennia? Or should I give it more RAM and a better video card? Let me know what you think should happen in the comment section. Thanks for hanging around till the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're new here, why not subscribe and stick around for all sorts of future retro hijinks? And thanks to my Patreon supporters for helping make these videos possible. That's it for this one, but I'll see you again soon.